What's good, everybody? Welcome back to another YouTube video. Today, Sebastian is going to share an insane TikTok case study. How he scaled a brand last year from zero to two million on TikTok within 70 days. He's going to cover everything from the creators to the offer, product market fit, landing pages, and how he was able to scale the brand so much on TikTok that the German television did an exclusive documentation about it. So again, really happy to have you, brother, and let's get started with this. Dude, thank you very much for having me. Yes, it was a blast scaling those TikTok accounts uh, on the German TikTok market there. And uh, it was a lot of fun to actually crush like the competition there <laughs> by a couple of meters. And uh, yeah, today we're going to talk about how we did that. Just a basic rundown and um, hopefully enable some other brands to successfully scale on TikTok because you don't see that many guides how to spend like 25k per day and we had like multiple 100k days so uh, this is going to be some fucking funny shit so let me share my screen really quick you can see everything right yes sir yes as always high production value uh, on, a, on a neat google doc but this is basically the presentation two million and 70 days 100k days and a tv feature this is our full tiktok ads guide 2023 and um, this is the product we scaled it's basically the crystal shaver known as blimi or like other brands that scaled that in the past and we had a big run on tiktok so much that the german television rtl didn't let an exclusive series about the product because we were basically buying all of the tiktok ads inventory for a couple of weeks there and there was like no escape from our product on tiktok and it was some funny stuff and to verify that this works um this is like an insight in our tracking solution we use hyros of course and we had like over a million in revenue here uh, at our first push and we had multiple 100k days back to back and the scaling went from zero to 100 really quick from like 10k per day to 34k per day over 50k per day 80 96 100k and then we cruised on 100k days for a couple of days and this happened rather fast and leads me to my core concept that TikTok ads still are one of the biggest chances in performance marketing, but definitely not how everyone claims to be using them. And a short little introduction of my case, my name is Sebastian, founder of Iron Media. We build in-house media buying teams and recruit A players through our proprietary framework. My e portfolio did 300 million in revenue 2021 with 40 mils in ad spend. And last year we cracked 450 mils in revenue with 60 million ad spend on all platforms that you can imagine. I'm also a count hold, a member of the Two Comma Club X Award from ClickFunnels for like 10 million verified revenue there with our consulting offer. We work with 450 clients. And of course, like Homozi is telling you, I have nothing to sell you. This is like the last dollar online principle that we don't want to help you make the first euro online, but hopefully the last one. So afterwards you have like generational wealth that builds from Hucom Endeavor. And the goal of the presentation is we need to define what we want to go after. And global deleveraging and economic downturn just demand capital efficiency like there is no tomorrow. And most of e-com brands are heavily undervalued because of underutilized growth potential. If that is the case, we certainly can't work with them, which is sad for them because we can help them a lot. And getting you guys to the level of seven figures per year allows us to get the total addressable market for our offer way broader. And in order by doing that, we can build trust with seven to nine figure brands because there are so many gurus claiming that they have some results. They're claiming like fake results, but no one is really cracking down how they did it. And this is the goal that we really want to crack down how we did that. And this presentation is for obviously e-commerce brands with strong Meta and Google ads or brands that are already advertising on TikTok but want to scale to high five figure per day or fresh startups on the lookout for capital efficient growth. And I added the dropshippers who want to make fat bags ASAP because this is like what a lot of the guys still want to do. And I can't um, say something against that because in that case, it was a dropshipping store. So might as well. Uh, spill the beans there why is now the best time to do that well tiktok algorithm is getting fucking sexy more user growth than advertiser growth still cheap C cpms the first waves of opportunists is gone and the platform is maturing into his, into his prime and if you can crush in q2 this year this just lays the roadblocks for a crazy q4 this year afterwards so if you can get like the scale right now this 
gets you so many new buyers, so many exposure, and so many learnings in what works in your accounts that it just makes sense to crush it right now. And when we did that, we were in Q3, so nothing from Q4 uh, in front of us. So we scaled it in, yeah, basically the summer hole, as you want to say it, just to show you that it's possible and you can still get some awesome numbers in Q1, Q2. Disclaimer at first, this is what worked what work for us. Like there are so many ways to skin a cat. This is only based on our own ad spend and what worked in this specific case. And of course, cross-reference from other scaling operations that we did on TikTok. But there are, as I mentioned, so many ways to run TikTok ads that there is no one-fits-all solution. So it very well could be that some of the steps have to be individualized or like are different in your case. This doesn't invalidate this concept. It actually proves them because if the basis is in place, and I'm going to tell you that you need some individual components there, this is just how it is. But I think seeing how we did that is the biggest lever that you could have. And I put everything in uh, a chronological order. And the first step, and I called, coined it step 01 because it started before we even started, is that we had to find a unique positioning, a unique product, or a unique market to go after. And I purposefully let that open because the last video we did on your channel, we talked about that quite a bit, that if you want to go after a big market share, you have to identify an opening that is unique in your case. And the easiest thing is that you, that you have a unique product. But this is like the rarest case that you could go after because a really unique product is not that easy to find. If you have a unique market, this could be more in the cards for most of the guys because you can take a product that is normally sold before and you can build your own market around that. Or you can have like a unique access channel, which means that you have a channel where you, this product hasn't been scaled before. And one of those unique factors is enough for you to really take advantage of the ad platforms. But I like to have multiple of those unique positionings. And in our specific case, we had those crystal shaver, which were pretty hot at that time. But why was it hot? Because it was summer, it was a unique market because the shaving market just expands at that time of the year. And it looked fucking new. And I mean, if you're a dropshipper and you are around Alibaba, of course, you know all of the products. But for most of the people in the market, this was a unique product that they haven't saw before because it used like a unique mechanism that you're just rubbing your hair away on your legs and stuff instead of shaving it. So this was like a very unique product. And then we used a unique market because if all of your competition is doing razors or like shavers and you have a unique mechanism that uh, leads into that, you have a unique market there too because you don't have competitors. The only competitors that you have are people who are selling the same products, but we can crush them on the media buying side. And we had a unique access channel because most of the products had been scaled on Facebook and we identified that rather fast. So we just committed ourselves to crush um, TikTok as a channel and we just made it work. Like there is no quick fix, no easy way to scale it. You have to commit to a certain channel if it's like, unique in order to scale it that way. And we saw a lot of brands with like very ununique product that like commoditized products that could crush it on TikTok because no one else committed in crushing the platform for you. So the unique positioning was, it was a pretty good product. We had a unique market because um, we're not selling razors, we're, share, we're selling like a unique mechanism. And we had a unique access channel, which is TikTok ads instead of Facebook ads. And by doing that, we just had like exponential growth potential there. And if you have a product right now that you're committed to, you have to ask yourself, is there a way that we can position some of those unique factors onto that before starting and this just makes sense in order to do that and we even do that on supplements we do that on um, health we do that on beauty you can always find some unique way your product works a unique mechanism or you can identify a unique segment of a market that hasn't been marketed to before like we did on the case study um, with nomisk so once everything is in the books there um, you have to of course make the tech setup but this is no technic tutorial here. Like I don't want to uh, spend time like getting the conversion uh, sets there in action. I don't want to implement the pixels and stuff. To be fair, I wouldn't bother with stuff for too long. Just 
Google it or like chat GPT it like the new wave is and um, hire a dev from Fiverr, go look it up on YouTube. You don't need to hear it that from me, just type into YouTube, how to install a TikTok pixel. Like it's really not fucking difficult and people make so many excuses because they're not familiar with like the tech setup and how to uh, open up an ad account and they want you to, um, they want to see you doing it. But this is basically a very weird mindset. Just get it over with and uh, start with the nitty gritty. Step one, the actual step one, of course, is the ads because the war is not won like on the media buying side, but on the ads that you're working with. And the ads are the most impact important factor, period. The ads, the psychology behind the ads is like way different than on Meta because we are doing a disruption marketing, which means people are not actively looking for products there, especially on new platforms like TikTok, where they are used to just seeing a lot of good value entertainment, but after all, they're just not used on buying from this platform because it's fairly new. If you're on Instagram or Facebook, you just expect people trying to sell you stuff because the algorithm is optimized to balance out like consuming content and seeing ads. But if you're launching a new platform like TikTok, they have to heavily lean on the content side and only sprinkle on the ad side. So you don't have that many chances in order to convert them. And this is like disruption marketing at its finest because in the perfect world, you have content that is that native for them that they don't even realize that this is an ad. And you have to be like in the trends and the biggest things that are coming up there because you don't want to be like those cringy boomer companies who try to be on TikTok because it's just cool. You want to be like very native and in the perfect world that people don't even know that they're seeing an ad. They're just seeing like a video where by chance something uh is optional to buy that if you want to say it like that and there are no set in stone best practices for like the perfect ads on tiktok because your demographic is different on every product that you're selling and the demographic on tiktok is changing so you have to build your own best practices based on your creative testing that we're going to go after in the step two but we have five styles that are always um predominant in the space which at first is like the showcasing which basically is the, the stuff you know from Facebook. It's just showing the product, talking about it, seeing some features, like the unique way there. It just has to be catered to the TikTok style with like better um, edits and better cutting, better music, or like a younger demographic seen in the video. Then you have shared formats, which is basically the memification, like the meme culture there. It's like a POV, you're doing X, Y, Z. And then they are just showing like the, the style there. So you have to have like a native way of integrating into the typical trends that are on the platform. I uh, call the shared formats because these are like the formats where people are sending it to their friends and they're laughing about it. And it's like meme culture. These are like the formats there. Then it's the wow factor. It's basically those wow scenes that give you like huge dopamine spikes. And it's exactly the the style of content when you're having a coffee break and you're glued to your screen for like 30 minutes. It's not because you're just seeing people dancing. You're seeing something with shock value, breaking news, wow scenes, stuff that is binge watch worthy. And um, this is hard to do, we, but we're going to talk about that after. And then it's basically shock factor or thirst traps. Shock factor is um, really snapping them back into reality. Like... <sighs> Giving them an example, like you told me that um, if you're breathing through your nose and one of your, uh, no, your nostrils is uh, congested, you're stressed. <laughs> this is really putting you into reality again because you want to try it and you're getting engaged into, into your ad. And the last one, of course, I never seen them and I think you never seen them too. It's like thirst traps <laughs> where it's people who try to get your attention by having like a female model or a male model if that floats your boat um, and showing something um, on a thirst trap side where you're just expecting to see something loot. But after all, it's just an attention grabber for them to showcase the product. And these are like the five styles we always identify there. And there is no way for you to actually see which style of that works before trying it. And I would totally suggest um, for you to try every one of those concepts if possible and if you can't build out every five of those concepts just do like two to three of them because you just can't guess what happened and i included our ad that drove more than a million in revenue here which we can take a look because 
we had two pushes at those um, out, at their brand. The first push was just with the typical five creators concepts here. It was basically the showcasing style, and it was a shared format where um, girls were showing their clean shaven legs. But once we had the traction from the um, um, from the television show, we 100% ripped the content and we did some ads based on the social proof that we uh, got there. But you don't need to be on German television in order to do ads like that. You can always find some stuff from the TV or like from YouTube or from documentaries and stuff where something is talked about the product. So you're leveraging social proof some, from somewhere else. In our case, we were just that fortunate that we had the social proof exactly um, about us. But let's take a look at the ad. It's rather short. And it's basically the German news anchor just telling you, um, but you can look at, that, look at it at the document. There is a new trend going on. Um, it's like the crystal shaver. And then they even tested it. And then we lay it onto our UGC inside of there. And we basically just layered a couple of sentences there and like the testimonial that happened in the show because the test wasn't that bad. <laughs> so they actually liked the product, which was surprising for us. Uh, but we, of course, used that in order to um, include some captions, include the scenes and make it pretty seamless. And this ad is like, it was edited on like CapCut on the phone. Like there is really no, uh, no high production value inside of there. And it's just the scenes with a couple of captions and that's it. And this ad alone drove 1 million in revenue. So you never know what will be the winning ad. And in order to get to that point, you have to try out multiple concepts here. And the key facts for the editing are just fast cutting, zoom in and zoom out because you don't want to grab the attention even better. In video captions, of course, like natively done in the platform or like on Instagram. Background music, um, we used a pretty viral music piece here um, that I don't want to uh, play here because of the copyright stuff. But if you become a user of the app for a couple of days or weeks, you can get a pretty good grasp on what the current trend is and which music you can utilize. And Afterwards, I would suggest you deleting the app because it just sucks your soul if you're looking at way too much or you can put your phone on uh, black and white like Carl suggests me. That was like a big tip in order to uh, yeah get the dopamine spike there down. One thing that's super important and I really like that you mentioned it, you do not have to over-engineer the creators that you push out into the market, right? A lot of people are so stuck in the uh, phase where they over-analyze, oh, which creative do I have to do? Do I have to hire an agency or do I have to hire a production team or something crazy like that? This is the perfect example. Like they did over a million in revenue from a uh, video that they basically cut on their phone of like a free app, right? So yeah. the most important thing, and I want to put uh, emphasis on this is, you have to understand how TikTok works and also what are the current trends and viral themes that are happening on TikTok right now in terms of the style, the editing, the uh, video itself, the music, and the overall, is it like a challenge or something that's going on, right? Because TikTok is so, so fast paced that you have to keep up with the trends because otherwise your content will not stand out in like the crowd of content. So that's why Sebastian suggested here to really utilize TikTok yourself so you get an understanding of what works and what has a lot of engagement. Yeah, 100%. Because if you just have like a theory what works there, you have no idea how natively it seems uh, on the platform. So I would just become a user for a couple of days see what kind of ads you're seeing and see what is like disrupting you in a way where you're like, okay, that was fucking smart. And I spend way too much time, but because it's like the highest level of creativity, like on those platforms to just look at what the current sentiment is. Like I am spending like, I think one to two hours a day, just looking at ad libraries, looking at um, spy tools, looking at other ads and stores, just to be like really on top of the mountain regarding where the trends are. And this always allows us to be way more efficient in our creative concepts because we can just pick up on trends pretty fast. And as you mentioned, the product production value is pretty low. So we can just churn out a lot of iterations and a lot of concept really fast. And in a perfect world, you, you go from a, an idea to a concept to it uh, being in the final form in like under 24 hours. This is like the perfect way for TikTok to work. I mean, if you can condense the time down from like two weeks, to even just three days, it will be so far ahead of the competition there. It's not even funny. 
Um, pretty good point. Thank you for that. Step two is the capital efficient testing because the problem is money burning is not an option for most of the guys. And even though we have capital to throw at those problems, I hate wasting money too. So we, ha we have to come up with a solution, which is a, a testing framework based on the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule basically, where I am totally comfortable of missing like the small 20% of like perfect ads where there could be some form of traction where if we put way too much testing budget on them. But I just want to iterate fast, identify the winners really fast. And if there are like one or two creatives that don't get the love that uh, that they deserve, like I'm totally comfortable with that because it just funnels into the greater mission that I want to take the low hanging fruits that are working. And I don't want to squeeze like the last ounce of efficiency just out of every creative that we can work with. And what we do in our framework is pretty easy. It's just a typical old ABO testing that you know from Facebook. You go through four different um, audiences. I always start with an open targeting based on demography, age, or sex, a broad interest, which can just be dog, cat, or like pets, a specific interest, which is more honed down, like wristwatches, luxury jewelry, just something that is more specific could be even like dog breeding or something like something pretty weird if you think your product is a, a fit for that. And then lastly, hashtags. And in order to find hashtags, as we mentioned, you have to become a user of the platform because you can't just make assumptions what the hashtags are. You just have to look at what worked. And a hashtag that you see in the wild more often is like way more efficient than something you dig up in your app manager because it just comes up when you type in certain keywords. So it's definitely better if you know your stuff on platform and to work on it outside of the platform. Then with those four audiences, I'm just throwing two to three ad concepts from the step one into the audience, into the ad set. And I just let it run wild with doubled the um, AOV as a budget for the ad set. And this looks exactly like that. And excuse the German here. Uh, we did the presentation in German uh, before, but I think, you know what I try to do? ABO testing campaign. Four ad sets, three ad concepts inside there. And I'm not bothering with like weird hook tests here. This is for the next step, but this is very, very easy how we are starting that. And you can do that even on a small budget, but I like to start with um, double of the AOV as a budget because I want to get some validity in there in the shortest amount of time possible. And if you're just spending less budget on a daily, you just elongate the time you need to actually find significant data there. And I like to get over with as fast as possible for the long-term version that we will be capital efficient faster that way. And if we structure like that, we just schedule it for the next day and let it run from midnight and we'll wait for seven to two hours. I know it's hard, but you have to do it. And afterwards you have to just go into the ads, kill on the ad level stuff that are like weirdly outside of KPI. If you have too much killed on the ad level, you are going to go to the ad set level if they are very outside of KPI. And then you're just left with like the most promising ad sets here. You have to ask yourself, are there some winner audiences that have some traction? Are there some winner ads that perform on multiple audiences? And based on that, you're just building variations from the winner ads with a hook testing. So I'm not starting with like 10 different hooks on the same concept. I'm starting with like two to four concepts and once the concept gets traction that is like remotely inside of our kpis we then start honing down the hook element there because i don't want to spend too much time working on hooks for concepts that don't work so once we have the concept in place we are just going to do three hook variation it looks like that this is our audience the hashtags um, that we used like august and pride day um double the aov and then we split out the creative concept by three different hooks this could be just a pattern interrupt, a different opening, or like a different sequence of the creative that worked at first. And I just launched them onto the winning audience in a new ad set. If it's inside of KPIs, that's good. Like we, we succeeded with our test and we just hone down which hook works the best um, and just let it run and kill the others. It's a pretty um, results-driven approach. And then, of course, it's an ongoing process because you're identifying 
more and more winning audiences. By doing that, you're launching new ad variations onto your winning audiences. And once you have new creative concepts, you're testing them with new hooks on a continuum basis. And we have our testing campaign here that at some point looks like a gangbang orgy because we have so many adsets, uh, adsets here. Um, but you just have someone who falls through the cracks. You have some that work and you just throwing a bunch of stuff at the wall and see what sticks basically. So it's our testing campaign. If we have the testing campaign in place, like it's time for scaling and the scaling process starts as soon as we have a winning audience and ads that are inside of KPI. The first step that you could do is just raise the budget on the ad sets. Like there are so many guys who tell you not to do it. To be honest, I just do it. It works. So we're just raising the budget on the ad set that work by like 20%. This is the sweet spot for us and a pretty conservative approach in order to do that. The second is that we're just doing like a best of campaign, which is our scaling campaign. We do it as a CBO. We group together the best ad sets inside a CBO, like a best of album. Like imagine you're releasing multiple singles in your career and then the best ones you take onto a best of album. That is exactly what you want to do in your best of CBO. You have two to three ad sets that are either based on audience or creative concept and just include them there and put a fucking high AOV on those campaign in order for the algorithm to optimize based on the multiple ad set that you have there. Um, this is like the sweet spot for most of the guys if they don't want to scale it that hard. It's just finding out what works in the testing campaign and then combining it into a best of scaling campaign with a high enough budget in order for you to see some significant growth there. Um, I would constantly try to test new iterations on the scale on the testing campaign and push them into this best of campaign this is like in a perfect world you're working with those campaigns for like a long period of time because you're just collecting the data inside the campaign and you're pushing new ads into the working ad sets once you have proven in your scale in your testing campaign that they work and if you continue to do so and you just killing ads that are outside of KPI and introducing new ads that are inside of KPI, you can basically raise the budget every three days by 20% if the KPIs are met. And that's exactly what we did here. So we just continue to raise the budgets like as enforcing function in order to find out which ads are dying and then just put them out and put some new in in order to sustain the growth. And in my opinion, if you really want to push that big, you have to have the forcing function that you are like, remotely forced to raise the budget and you do everything in your power to not lose money even if you're raising budget. So this is like the mindset that I'd like to be on TikTok. And if those CBO campaigns are outside of KPI for like more than seven days, then I would just reduce the budgets in order for more efficiency to take place. And you of course have to test more ads if you can't sustain the growth that you're pushing there. This is like a big theory, but it looks like that. You have a CBO campaign, 10 to 15 X your AOV. You have in our instance, we had just two ad sets inside there, a broad ad set and an interest ad set. And you will have here your winning hooks and creative concept. It's like hook two, concept one, hook four, concept two, hook two, concept five. And you're just grouping them together as you found out in the testing campaign. And anyone can do that. It's really no rocket science. Um, you just have to really work your way onto finding those variations here. And if you structure it in a way where the creative concept is your North Star, and then you're iterating the concept based on hooks, this is the most efficient way to find the creatives here. And this is the process of um, that I mentioned. You're testing some hooks here, and the winner is just getting added onto your winning ad set inside your scaling campaign. And if you're just doing that, you're like completely fine, and you're way better off than most of the gurus tell you because some weird structures there are just there to confuse you and you have no idea what actually works. So you're just spraying and praying it basically. So this is like, everything is here based on lowest cost. So lowest cost means that we're just spending like a daily budget. For most of the brands, this is fine. But in our case, we just saw so much traction that we wanted to push it even further and spend more than 5K per day. And we did that by using cost caps. Cost caps is basically just a bid strategy that you're using on your ads. And instead of telling the algorithm, I want to spend 500 bucks per day, you're telling the algorithm, you can spend as much as you want to if my 
um, CPA is like below this point, or like if my bid is below the point that I'm giving you. Um, this does not mean that you only can give your conversions at that CPA because you're missing so many conversions um, measured by them. It basically just means this is the highest amount of bid that I'm going into in the auction of the platform. And you have to find out which bid leads you the most results. And in order to find that out, what we do is we just duplicate the first campaign here and we set a 20 or 30 or 40 X um, AOV as a daily budget. And then we set the cost cap at 20% of your normal CPA. So if your normal CPA is 10 bucks, you're setting it at a, at a bit of like 12 bucks because you want to shoot over for like 20% more than your typical paying. And in order to do that, you just have to duplicate the campaign and set the bid strategy. And this allows you to spend way more on days where you're getting a lot of traction. And the algorithm is spending way less on days where you're not getting traction. So after like a couple of weeks, you have so much efficiency there if you are leading by if you're leading the account by bids and not by just daily um, investment that you're sending over there. So this is like the sweet spot for most of the brands that have to look out for inventory and stuff because they scale, can't scale that much. You just work your way to the best of CBO and afterwards you are duplicating it in a more cost efficient way by using cost caps. But in our case, we wanted to push it even further and we did it by day parting cost caps. I know that uh, a good friend Parsa uh, was talking about that on Twitter too. Cost caps, um, like day parting, that is the shit. You are identifying the best hours of the day and you run ads specific to this time slot. And I definitely have to give credits uh, to him on that case because I saw it on Twitter and I was like, this sounds fucking smart, let's try it. So we did that. Um, you're duplicating the CBO again. So you have your own day parting CBO. You set the cost cap at like double or triple the amount of the CPA that you're getting. And then you're just pitting the time slots where your ad should serve, which are based on the highest spending hours of your day in your store. And you can just easy check that on your Shopify dashboard. And if you just condense your campaign to a couple hours and you set the delivery to accelerate it, then you will push out so much budget at that time slot because you just want to spend the budget as fast as possible but you have it limited by the bid that you gave it at first. So you have basically the Goldilocks of both sides. You have the aggressive bid and this time slot where you're just bidding way more than the competition. And this is the way that led us to spend like over 10 to 15K per day just on those campaigns because we just limited it to the best time slots possible for the day, which in our case were between 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. That was our best time slot. And you can even segment that even further um, if you have a very um, sophisticated approach there where you are spending way less at the beginning of the day and you spend very hard at the end of the day and in order to by doing that you can just reduce your marketing um, expenses because you're just focusing on the best time for you and it of course depends on the product that you're selling but we had a lot of success with that and you can even like triple down or like quadruple down on that because you then have a couple of hour slots that you can go after and you can do like an aggressive bid from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. and then a more conservative bid from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. This is where media buying gets fun here, but it works so easy if you do like the work before where you can just work with the working campaigns and you don't have to figure out what actually is working and you just have to figure out where you want to spend the most of time possible. And I feel kind of like a day trader in that instance, which uh, is, <laughs> you're feeling like a hacker or like a day trader, but uh, this is a lot of fun in that case and it makes your day more exciting. Um, the second option is basically cost cap squeezing, um, which we normally do once we have a lot of competition there or we can't scale that high because we're limited by inventory, which is trying to figure out how can we get as much conversions as possible for the lowest amount of CPA possible. And we just take what works again, we switch it to cost cap, and then we duplicate it like 10 times with multiple different bids. Because as I mentioned, you're going into the auction based on your bid that you're giving the campaign. And if you're just setting it like a staircase where you have a 10 euro bid, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, you just find out which bid leads you the best bang for your buck. And then you let it run for a couple of days. You kill everything that's not working and you're left with like a bid at, I don't know, 17 bucks, eight bucks and five bucks or something. And you just know that those are your best spending bids 
at the time right now. And you can do that every couple of weeks to find out what the most efficient bid in your case is and just get the account more efficient by doing that. And I really like the approach, to be honest. Um, the third step we did, and that was only after doing the day parting, doing cost cap squeezing at the same time, where we just wanted to push like above 20K ad spend per day, was that we downgraded the conversion events in order to get more traffic. Because as you can imagine, going for a purchase conversion event is the most expensive way in buying traffic because you get the buying the highest buying intent audience. But there are a lot of guys or like a lot of girls on the platform who are not like perfectly buying ready. But if your store and your product is great, they can be convinced that they want to buy. And in order to do that, you just duplicate what works in your purchase campaigns. And you set the conversion event like one step down to like an issue checkout or add your cart. And the psychology behind that is that you want to just buy more traffic for cheaper than you're doing on the purchase side. And you are diversifying the total addressable market that you're going after because you're targeting different pockets of your market and get just way more traffic onto your store. And we saw some nutty numbers on website traffic uh, once we did that. And because we had the conversion rate in place and the man for that is sitting right here, uh, we had a lot of uh, success based on the conversion and consumer psychology there. And um, yeah, we could just play around with the traffic. And we just knew for a fact that no one was buying add to cart traffic at our spend. And we can just be way ahead of the competition there and just uh, flood the store with traffic. And once you have that in place, this is a screenshot exactly from our account. We had some crazy campaigns here, to be honest. We had some, this, uh, this like daily performance, I think. We had, uh, we had, we had a 10x ROS on those campaigns here, broad targeting. We had Spark ads that we tried for like 22x ROS, or like here, the new test that we did that just crushed. And one word to Spark ads, I'm a skeptic uh, behind Spark ads because it's pretty impossible to get them to work out of the gate. But once you have something that is proven, like actually proven, you can just take that and duplicate it onto like the Spark ad in order to have like more of the native integration into the platform. But I wouldn't start with that, to be honest. We didn't, we just put everything that works at first and then duplicated it, um, like made it to Spark and Pay. Yeah, pretty interesting stuff. After step three, this is where we started to really talk about um, the conversion side. Um, because I talked about this case study before, like uh, in the German market and stuff. And I just was uh, telling them about the ad buying side, but we had a lot of support from your side there too. So I really appreciate that because it allowed us to scale way faster and harder here. And what we did is the logic behind extremely high traffic with low buying intent that we're buying here at that point. And instead of making the ads 20% more profitable, why not just double your conversion rate? <laughs> it would be that easy, like it would be a good guess. But if you are doubling conversion rate, you are cutting your ad costs in fucking half. So you can spend like twice the amount of ad spend there. And once I um, understood that in our case, that it wasn't like the biggest lever reducing our ad cost even 20% more because we're buying for like three bucks CPMs. I mean, how cheap can you go? Um, we just had to convert more traffic um, in our case. And in my opinion, in our instance, like two ways that uh, really crushed were, first of all, like a pre-sale landing page. You might saw them from uh, your recent video that did with the Udi or like the stuff that you talked about, the landing page frameworks on my channel. These are awesome if you're buying like a buckload of traffic and you just want to convince them that your product is a solution. So pretty cold in the traffic conversion cycle. It's just a pre-framing before they actually get to like the price. And um, this worked pretty well. But what worked even better in that case, because the product was just not that heavy on the explanation side was like just an optimized product page slash landing page, just like a hybrid of both, which I really enjoy working with because you just make the product page way more convincing. And I know that a couple of brands that you're crushing with, you have like those hybrid in place, but what I really enjoy because you don't have to track like another touch point before you're just sending them onto the most optimized approach of product pages there. And um, I really enjoyed working with uh, the optimized product pages. And it's in my opinion, the best, method for like easy products to sell because you don't have to walk them through a whole editorial. But if you can make them work, you can sign up for people copying it ASAP. So you might as well try getting pre-sale landing pages uh, to work also in that case. Do you want to add something to the um, pre-sale and optimized product page uh, side here? 
Yeah, so your, uh, your points were already really good. Uh, just again, to kind of like put some emphasis on what you said. So what Sebastian is doing here, and that's like why they were so far ahead of the competition is from the media buying side, they not only bought the traffic that was high intent, but they also spent a lot of money on buying traffic that was a bit lower in the buying intent, right? So they they just had a lot of traffic on the page that that wasn't necessarily targeted from competitors. And then also they had another differentiator, which was pushing them to either a pre-sale page or a highly optimized product page. So we have two differentiators and two competitive advantages in one case, right? Which is like insane, <laughs> which is really putting you ahead of the competition. And this is what you got to figure out. What can you do in the ad set of things with like a unique angle or a unique product market fit or unique media buying strategy, for example, buying the more lower intent traffic or what you can do on the funnel side with utilizing pre sale pages or like highly optimized product pages. Um, so yeah, if the product page is still live, you could show it to in a quick example if you want, because um, I think that's going to give them like a good view. Yeah, um, I don't think it's live right now, but we can, if I, if I find it again, because uh, I can include it into the document. Perfect, so quick little run on the product page that I have to take from my uh, German video that I did, because we just scaled this offer down. What we did here is basically a pretty normal, um, Way of running the product pages in our case which is we had the product at first we then had um, the multiple buy boxes that we after some tests um, arranged in a way where, we, where you're just buying two instead of one so they work pretty well we then had all of the trust symbols here we had a couple of good product images that we did i really love the um, product feature um, uh, the product feature image that we had here because people could just see the difference between razor blades and the normal shaver and then we included uh, something because of the mechanism we want to explain the mechanism in a gif here and then it's basically just are you ready for summer smooth skin the best thing is you're um it's so easy and like like normal um plugging your hair but like without pain and you're even um even using like an exfoliation of your skin at the same time no more cutting yourself no irritations that was basically the claim and then we had um, the going against each other like the rubby versus a typical plastic shavers and then we just elaborated more on why it works and then we had some features what people who are using it are experiencing but we had the page here as in constant and we just scrolled down here for the for the ones to see had of course our money back guarantee based on the value equation that Carl talked a bit about a lot and then we had like a free um like a testing offer which was uh let me pick it up here test it for 14 days and if you're not satisfied just send it back which funnily enough is what you're legally obligated to do in Germany either way so we could frame it as a win and um, yeah we then had a lot of social proof these were actual results so it was legitimate um, uh, testimonials and yeah we basically added more colors we had like the um, the buy two instead of one which was our our perfect uh, product here and that was our product page with the key facts here that I really enjoy working with. And it doesn't look too crazy, but after all, it converted at a uh, above 4% uh, conversion rate, which was insane. I cut the product page inside here because um, I think it's pretty good for you to see it uh, live. And it looks pretty minimalistic, but that was kind of the method there because we work from like a pretty stuffed uh, website and we just scrapped everything that wasn't attributing to the conversion side there. And um, I really enjoyed uh, working on the product page because afterwards it was just crushing it even on low intent traffic. So afterwards, um, we just, we did that way too late, to be honest, um, but you have to put some fuck ups, upsells, downsells, and cross sells. I mean, we just went by the saying first flow then friction. I wanted to just get as many sales in there as, pos um, as fast as possible, but after all, you have to figure out what like the highest CPA is you can afford. And you should push your media buying up until that point where after a week, you're spending like the highest amount of CPA possible. And afterwards, you just have to look at how can we increase our AOV or lifetime value 
And we always do that by a cold friendly offer, which is either bundling, upselling, downselling, have some subscriptions inside there. Um, this is the best way in order to just stay with what works, stay in the flow, and then add friction on the conversion side later, where you're doing some post-purchase upsell, some bundle offers, some subscriptions, just anything that pushes your AOV over the shortest amount of time possible and to condense the LTV um, by profit velocity in our case. And we did that way too late. Like we could have even scaled it even further, but um, yeah, you can't have everything, right? So afterwards, um, I want to add some thing here because in regards of tracking. So, I mean, you know, after RS 14, you can't see shit on platforms. Like it's just the norm. So we use Hyros in our case. You saw it in our, um, in our first um, dashboard here. And what I really like on Hyros is that every ad channel that you can imagine is on a, like is integratable on Hyros. So you can just have everything there inside one platform and you don't have to don't have to bother in condensing that into like a supermetric spreadsheet or something. So go with what worked for you. I can just tell you what we did and I really liked seeing the LTV inside there. So regarding to the tracking, um, that was it on the tracking side. Um, step five is teams and workflows because your level of scale will be limited by different constraints. The first level of scale is solely depending on your creative output. We talked about that. The second level of scale is solely depending on back-end tasks that you can master, like optimizing your product pages, including upsells and down sales, optimizing your email marketing, all of that stuff. And you can't work fast enough there. In my opinion, this is like impossible as a one-man show. So you have to have like your first and second hire in place here with like creative sourcing and cutting if you um, are not prolific with that. But this is your first bottleneck to solve, creative sourcing and cutting of the creatives. Because even if you are good in that stuff and you can deliver some bangers, you just want to increase the output because this is the highest ROI activity that you can do. So even if you're doing it, bring something along you who's cutting next to you. The third hire is the backend integrator. It's pretty difficult, to be honest, um, to outsource everything in a, in a pace where it makes sense for you. I mean, we work with a lot of email agencies in the past and we have some clients who are still working with them. But in our case here, we had like a short time frame of three months, like we scaled it in 70 days and we couldn't have the time to get like an agency in place, pull out some briefings, let them work on it. Then two weeks are gone and you can't do shit. So you have to be a menace in order to really do the necessary work as fast as possible. And if you're starting with that, I will just bring in like a backend integrator that helps you with that. Someone from like a Discord channel, something from a community, someone from our school community or something like that. Someone who has a little bit of expertise that you can get into the process that is just, that's just working on the product with you. And um, we had a backend integrator in place. Two of the founders were just cutting creatives and sourcing them every single day. And um, we had a lot of traction by just doing that. And the fourth hire could technically be a media buyer if you decide to open up more platforms because TikTok is, it's a beast. You really have to tame it and you want to have your whole focus just on TikTok and then have someone helping on the media buying side for Facebook. But we're going to talk about that in uh, two minutes because the whole synthesis of the process before hiring a media buyer is at first, get your tech in place, build your ads, test some capital efficient, scale in every department uh, possible that we mentioned, optimize the backend and optimize your team structure in order to scale like a motherfucker. <laughs> so this is the way to do, way to go and you can move really fast doing that. And some expected problems here, the first creative concepts of course will be shit. <laughs> like it will be, like there is no other way around that. Your first creative concept will be pretty bad, but this is expected. You have to expect failure. If you're not used to that, you just have to commit yourself to it because if you're not getting failure on your attempt, you're not pushing hard enough. So first creative concept will be shit. Then multiple rounds of creative concept will be needed. You will be so annoyed by getting so much content out there and seeing little traction in the first couple of days, but this is expected. Then your scaling that you're trying to do in a perfect world will break at some point because the lack of creatives, it's just how it is. Um, you, even if you get that down, 
your conversion rate, your AOV and your lifetime value will limit you in scaling. So you have to solve that. The manpower will limit you if you're spending all of your time on um, those store. You have to bring someone on and you shouldn't work with agencies like on the email or the media buying site. You should bring someone in who helps you with that. I wouldn't even work with a creative agency because they are not iterating that fast. You should do it manually and bring someone in who's doing this stuff with you. The wrong employees will make you rip your hair out. It's just how it is. Like your first hire won't be the perfect one. And you will have the wrong brand structure at, at the end, even if you succeed in scaling that. Where afterwards, like we did too, we are just pretty annoyed that we didn't push that even further because we just lacked on the backend operations here. And we just made like two to three million more out of it. And this is the whole roadmap for TikTok that I included here for everyone to check out. You have to TikTok ads, you have to testing a scaling framework, you have your account structure, your creative production, you do your audience tests, you have your winning audience, and then you're testing your ads. And then you have the scaling framework, you're duplicating the winner ad sets, you're doing manual builds, manual builds, you have your day parting, your cost gap squeezing, or your aggressive bidding on the bully method. And what I really want to suggest you if you want to get TikTok um, working in a level of scale that you're uh, happy with, just follow the roadmap. You have to figure out your winning creative concept. You have to test a boatload of hooks, shift your winners into a scaling campaign, do some weird media buying tactics that won't make sense on other accounts, but only on your account, increase the AOV, LTV, and the conversion rate, continue spending more as a forcing function in order to see where your um, bottlenecks are. And then I would either do it myself if you have your first tires in place or bring in someone who helps you on the media buying side that you cover your bases with Google because this is something that we left out here. We did 2 million in seven days on TikTok, but 1 million on Google in the next 20 days because we just picked up all of the scraps left and right. And we even pushed uh, the performance max campaigns to give like the holistic full funny experience for our buyers. And it really solved the acquisition problem for us after all. And the performance max and scaling stuff we did in our last video together, spending 164K per day. Um, this is exactly the framework we did um, on the Google side. And a very low hanging fruit that I want to end this with, the first access channel is um, your TikTok ads, of course. But if you have that in place and it's soft, like on a level of scale that you're happy with, it's the easiest way to diversify your traffic if you're just getting those working TikTok creatives onto Facebook. And I would do it um, uh, that way that you're doing the testing framework that we talked about um, in our last video. Pull out the creative engine in a way where you are basically repurposing your creatives in that way. Um, and then just progress to the scaling framework that I talked to that you. And if you're doing it in that order, it's not a complex business endeavor. Like, there is like a process in order to do that. And you should just follow the process because it works. And in my opinion, TikTok right now, if you have a product that is a product channel fit, just do it. I mean, bite the bullet and do the content train. And afterwards, you just will have pretty great numbers for you to maybe even be on television there too. But um, yeah, TikTok is awesome. And we have a lot of the stuff that we talked about, like the meta media buying, like the creative engine, how to do creatives that just clean, uh, clean up after you, like creatives that really smack you in the face. We all, everything we talked about, we have inside our free school community um, that I'm more than happy to share with you, man. Like it was an awesome idea from you to launch that. Um, we have some heavy hitters there, but I think I can give you the range for the school community right now as like the last resort. Um, in our presentation. Sweet, bro. First of all, thank you for this awesome presentation. You did an amazing bring that. Uh, yeah, so basically we launched the school community four days ago and it's already at 1,300 members. It's literally a free community where we teach people how to get from five figures to six figures a month in e-commerce. We're giving every way away for free. There's no need anymore to go into a high ticket coaching for beginners or waste your money on coaches or gurus or whatever. We have everything in the free skill community called Ecom Messiah. And I will also put the link to the Google document that you shared and also to join the community down below. So make sure to check that out. We are releasing videos like this every other day, talking about case studies, talking about creatives, media buying, conversion optimization, back end team structure, every single topic you can imagine. And we're literally solving every single bottleneck in your e-commerce brand together with you. 
so that you can apply it yourself and go to six figures a month. So thank you so much for joining, listening in today, and then see you in the next video, bro. Yeah, see you, man, and see you inside the community. Like we're spending a lot of time there. So uh, I would urge anyone to check that out, to be honest. It's our best work so far. <laughs> Sweet. Take care, bro. Bye-bye. <laughs>